Hey, what's up? It's Mai Yang from Mix in the Dark. Happy New Year, Nya Zhong Hyung Chia. We finally made it to year 2021. And I want to take a few seconds to welcome new and old listeners to this new year of true scary stories. I thank you for wanting to start off your new year with Mix in the Dark. I always like to say that Mix in the Dark is not my podcast, it is ours. I am just the voice that records and tells your stories. This podcast is alive and growing because of all your support, so thank you. As you may know, I took a whole month off to spend some time with my family for the holidays. I hope you were able to do the same. I know it's hard with an ongoing pandemic, but hopefully you were able to stay safe while doing so. I am currently staying at my sister-in-law's place in Texas, so shoutouts to all of our listeners from Texas as I record the first episode of the year in your state. There's nothing new with me, just that I am moving to a new location. I'll let you in on some tea about this location. An elder woman used to live in that space for a while before she passed of heart failure and old age. I can't tell you much more than that, but I can tell you that if anything weird happens, I just want to say I told you so to my very skeptical husband, and I will definitely report back. I have a story to start off the year for you. A trusted colleague gave me this story. It is about his family's experience in a particular house. He sent me a picture that is relevant to one of the stories about the house. You can view this photo on this episode's main YouTube title picture and the Mix in the Dark Facebook page. Once again, all stories I share are true, so please be respectful to the family's experiences. Please enjoy. The House in Fresno Have you ever heard of the Hmong term meaning that your house is in the location where a spirit portal exists? That location may also have more paranormal activities because of its geographical and environmental layout. This is why some Hmong elders follow certain rules when looking for a house to live in. Here are some of the rules. Number one, the house cannot be symmetrical. Symmetry creates a spirit portal in the center. Number two, the house cannot have a main road that leads directly to the front door. If it does, any bad or negative energy around will follow that road directly to your house. Number three, the front door and back door must not align with each other. If the doors are aligned, it makes it easier for a spirit to enter your house. And number four, the house cannot be surrounded by outdoor electrical currents. If your house is surrounded by electrical wiring or telephone lines, expect to experience lots of paranormal happenings. The electrical currents make it easier for spirits to be seen and heard. There's a house in Fresno that's probably Nyong Ya Che. I don't want to give away the location of the house, but the two main streets are Cedar and Ashland Avenue. My uncle and his family bought this house back in 2005. This was a nice house built in 1970 with a decent backyard but it had some kind of negative energy around it. I always get this feeling that there is something or someone watching me. Not to mention that it was always dark in that house, even in the middle of summer. This is a house that I consider I believe it is a reason for the paranormal occurrences that kept happening to my family. I will share some of the scary events that happened in this house. I do want to start off by saying that I am from Merced. These stories are based in Fresno, where the house is located. Story 1 I was dating a girl in Fresno where my uncle's house was. For reference, Merced to Fresno is about an hour drive. I remember my girlfriend and I went to the theater for a date. 
I later dropped her off and decided to go over to my uncle's house to sleep because it was already too late to drive home. Outside of my uncle's house were some green bamboos and some banana trees by the corner of their backyard gate. When I got there, my headlights shone into the banana trees. As soon as I did, I saw a white figure dash into their backyard. Their backyard was gated and locked. I did not see the white figure jump over the gate. Instead, it ran through it. A little shocked at the moment, I tried to rationalize what I saw and concluded that it was probably just my headlights that made it appear as if someone ran into the backyard. I thought back to the first time my uncle and my family did a shaman house cleansing ritual. Hmong folks usually perform this ritual when they first move into a house. The shaman saw someone in their house and told my uncle and his family that the house has an owner. That owner appears to be someone that lived there before my uncle and his family. That shaman wasn't the first to say that to my uncle's family. There is someone living in their house and is refusing to leave no matter what. I remember one time during the annual soul calling during the New Year's, we call this My family went to join my uncle's family. Some relatives also came over. Some kids were playing around the bamboo and banana tree area. My grandpa came out of the house and told the kids not to play around that area. I was there with my cousin and wondered why my grandpa wouldn't let those kids play in that area. My cousin told me that one of the shamans said that the banana tree has a spirit that lives there. His comment sent chills down my spine. Story 2 In 2008, we had a relative that died of gastrointestinal bleeding. He died during an EGD procedure. The doctor explained that as they were inserting the tube and camera into his esophagus, blood was pouring out of his mouth. The blood went into his lungs and he died of suffocation. I remember attending that funeral with all of my cousins. Hmong funerals usually last three days and three nights. My kid cousin Jay was there at the funeral too, and he would imitate how the drummer hit the Hmong funeral drum. The Hmong have a special drum for funerals. I'm not sure what the purpose of the drum is, but I think it helps guide the dead to the spirit realm and into the next part of death, whatever that may be. Every funeral has its own drum made specifically for the passing person at that funeral. That drum will get destroyed after it completes its duties of sending the dead to its destination. I remember being so tired from staying up all night at the funeral. I did not want to drive home to Merced, so instead I went to my cousin's house and took a nap on their couch. During my nap, I dreamt that I was walking alongside thousands of people. We were walking on a trail that circled a dark, rocky mountain that goes all the way up to the clouds. Everywhere we went, I heard the Hmong funeral drum playing in the background. I don't know why, but I felt so lost. Everyone around me was crying and sobbing as they walked the rocky trail. After a while, I saw up ahead, people were still walking, but their feet were no longer touching the ground. As I got closer, my body felt lighter and lighter, like it was being lifted up the ground. Just then, my cell phone underneath my pillow started ringing. I woke up from that dream and answered it. I couldn't hear anything. The only sound I could hear was gurgling from the other line, like someone was choking on fluids or saliva. 
I looked at my phone and did not see the caller's ID. I got scared, so I hung up. After I hung up, I heard Jay hitting the corner of the couch where I was napping. He hit the corner with two sticks and was imitating the drummer from the funeral. I started yelling at him to stop. No wonder in my dream I kept hearing funeral drums. I felt like he was sending me or guiding my sleeping spirit to the spirit world with his funeral drum imitation. Later that day, I told my grandma about my dream. Hmong folks have this superstition that when a spirit leaves the body or is lost from its owner, the person in the physical world will fall ill and eventually die. My grandma said that the funeral drum imitation that my kid cousin Jay did was sending my spirit on its way to the afterlife. But I may have been saved by our deceased relative, who was probably the caller. That's why I heard gurgling at the other line. What my grandma said about the gurgling made sense because our relative died of blood pouring out of his esophagus. This creeps me out. Story 3 This event took place in 2009. As you can already tell through my previous stories, my cousins and I are good friends. It was the middle of summer and he came to sleep over at our place. A week later, we went back to sleep at his place. When we got there, I saw my uncle sitting on the chair and my aunt was massaging his back. He looked tired, as usual. My uncle is a very sick man and has been sick for a while. What we didn't know was that that day would turn into a tragedy. My cousin and I were in their backyard when my little cousin Jay came out to tell me to call an ambulance for my uncle. I asked my aunt what happened so that I would know what to say to 911. My aunt told me that my uncle was having chest pain and couldn't breathe. I called 911. An ambulance came and took him to the hospital. Later, I went to the hospital to visit my uncle. All of our relatives were already there. I remember we all went to see him two at a time in the ICU. The doctor said it was a massive heart attack that probably happened the day before. They questioned why it took us so long to get him to the hospital when we knew that he had chest pain the day before. My uncle died that night. We all came back to my uncle's place. The relatives planned for his funeral in two weeks. Because we were at the hospital the whole day, everyone was tired. We set up a place to sleep in the living room. It was close to 1 a.m. when people finally decided to leave. I was still up watching TV. Just then, I heard a knock on the kitchen window. I paused to acknowledge the knock, but ignored it. After about five minutes, I heard another knock, but this time in the living room that I was in. I was a little scared, so I turned off the TV and closed my eyes to sleep. The day after my uncle passed, one of our Vang relatives decided to do a shaman soul calling ritual. This ritual usually happens when someone is sick and is not getting better. I wasn't there, but my oldest brother was. The shaman was a woman. This was when the strange event happened. A shaman is like the connection between the living and spiritual world. I can't entirely explain what they see in the spiritual world, but during this particular part in her ritual, she was on her horse trying to find the sick relative's lost soul. Usually when a shaman is on their horse in the spiritual world, what we would see in our world is her jumping. And as she wandered into the spirit realm, she saw someone blocking her path. It was my uncle. 
The shaman signaled a message back into the real world that my uncle was blocking her way. And because everyone was surprised and shocked at what the shaman was saying, they took out their cell phones to record the shaman. For some strange reason, everyone's phone was dead during this time. The only two phones that worked were the two Sonic Ericsson cell phones. One of them happened to be my brother's cell phone. As a non-religious person, I've never seen anything so strange. My brother showed me the video when I got to the place. In the video, the shaman had two voices. There was her regular voice and another voice crying. I couldn't hear exactly what they were saying because there were two voices talking at the same time in that video. But I'll tell you what I heard from the video. I heard the shaman say, Please don't stay here anymore. You can't stay here anymore. You have to go. My uncle's voice said, Last night, I came home and was knocking on the door and window, but my family wasn't home. No one opened the door for me. When I heard my uncle's voice in the video, I got chills all over my body. I guess that explained the late knocking that I heard the night my uncle passed. I heard my uncle again. This time he said, I can't believe I would end up like this. My uncle's voice was crying when he said that. This is all true and unfortunately recorded in a poor quality video. My brother transferred that video into my phone. I transferred the video into my computer and I also uploaded the clip into Photo Bucket, which is an online resource to upload and save your media files. I threw my old computer away after a while. I didn't think about saving that video. Unfortunately, when my ex and I broke up, she deleted everything in that photo bucket. I lost the video. I recently talked to my older brother to see if he still has that video. He said it's in his old Sony Ericsson phone and he still has that phone, but it's no longer working. Story four. This story happened in 2012. During that time, my sister attended Fresno State. While there, she stayed with my uncle's family. My sister slept in the same room as my aunt. One night, my aunt was on the phone late. After she hung up, she pulled the blanket up to her chest and turned to her side. As she was about to sleep, she opened her eyes to look at my sister to see if she was asleep. My sister appeared to be sleeping. Then she saw something move from the foot of her bed. She said it was dark and couldn't see who it was. But you know when you've known someone for a while, you can make out their body shape and how they walk even when they are far away? My aunt was sure that it was my uncle. Too afraid, she covered her head with her blanket. After a while, the room was empty again with no one else but herself and my sister. Story 5 In 2015, I moved to Fresno. One day, I was hanging out with my brother and his friends in their apartment pool. My phone rang. Grandpa is having severe headaches and was vomiting. Right away, two things came to mind. Swelling of the brain or bleeding inside of the brain. The reason I thought this was because my grandpa has high blood pressure and he's non-compliant with his anti-hypertensive meds. Later at the hospital, the doctors told us that our grandpa had bleeding inside of his head. It was a massive hemorrhagic stroke. The doctor explained that our grandpa will most likely end up in a vegetative state. And all that means is his body will depend on machines to keep him alive and he will no longer be able to communicate or 
understand anything or anyone. My grandma said that our grandpa did not want to depend on tubes and machines to keep him alive. Because of this, the family decided to let him go. We got to see our grandpa take his last breath after the nurse and doctor disconnected him from the breathing machine or ventilator. I remember when the relatives put the moan clothes on my grandpa. My grandpa was wearing a red string on his left wrist. This will be significant to the story later. That night, all of the relatives went to my cousin's house. I was in the backyard with everyone else. It was about 10 p.m. when a white pigeon landed on one of their orange trees. Then it came down to the grass. The elders there were all saying, This is your grandpa. He's probably just here to see you all one last time before he goes. I looked at the pigeon and it had a very tiny red string tied to its ankle. It happened to be tied specifically to his left ankle. I took a picture of it. I still have the picture, but it's hard to see the red string. I thought it was just a coincidence. Since 2009 to 2015, our family has gone through many tragedies. In 2009, we lost my Auntie Laura's husband to heart disease. That same year, my uncle passed away with heart disease due to kidney disease. Then, my dad passed away in 2011 to cancer. In 2015, my grandpa passed away due to hemorrhagic stroke. After a while, my aunt had a shaman over to do another house cleansing ritual. This time, the shaman told my aunt that he saw three spirits in their house. The first one was probably the one that lived there before my uncle's family. The other two spirits were my uncle and my grandpa. The relatives told my aunt to move the family out of that house. A distant relative saw this opportunity and offered to pay my aunt $20,000 if my aunt gave him the house. Out of desperation, my aunt actually went through with it and accepted the $20,000. I remember when we helped my cousins pack up to their new house, the neighbor from across the street came over and asked why we were moving. I told him about the whole situation. The neighbor was a middle-aged white man, and he has lived there for a while now. In the past, my uncle usually invited him over to eat during our family gatherings or cultural ceremonies and rituals. On that day, we asked him about the history of that house. When the house was sold to my uncle's family, my uncle was told that the house had no history of anyone passing inside of it. Since this man is close to my uncle's family, he told us that an elder man named John used to live in that house. John was a very sick man. He always had people coming over to take care of him. John's medical diagnosis included cancer, heart disease, kidney disease, and diabetes. John died of a stroke at the hospital. He did not die inside the house. What a coincidence that so many men in my family also died of heart disease, kidney disease, cancer, and stroke. My last uncle and auntie's husband, who's still alive, was recently diagnosed with diabetes. All of these men were connected to this house because they all agreed to purchase this house at the very beginning of it all. Last note. The relative that decided to purchase that house, just two months later, they moved out. We don't know why and they refuse to tell us the reason.